Senator from Utah. Madam President, on February 19th, 1942, and that'll be 80 years ago this coming Saturday, President Franklin D. Roosevelt issued Executive Order 9066, authorizing the blatantly racist mass incarceration of essentially all Japanese Americans inside the United States at the time. Uh, this was an indefensible move, one that resulted in locking up about 120,000 decent, hardworking, innocent people based on nothing other than their race. Two years later, in one of the most shameful moments in America's judicial history, the U.S. Supreme Court deferred to the Roosevelt administration's blatantly racist and equally unconstitutional imprisonment of Japanese Americans. Writing for the majority in a case called Korematsu versus United States, Associate Justice Hugo Black, a justice with a history of bigotry, unconscionably glossed over the countless constitutional violations built into the race-based internment of innocent American citizens, who the court acknowledged, quote, were loyal to this country, overwhelmingly, based on the fact that, quote, there was evidence of disloyalty on the part of some Japanese Americans, and military authorities considered that the need for action was great. In a moment one might expect uh, from someone like Justice Black, who had a, a history of bigotry. He cavalierly dismissed the blatant racism inherent in this action, reasoning that, quote, to cast this case into outlines of racial prejudice without reference to the real military dangers which were presented merely confuses the issue. Tragically, Justice Black, blinded perhaps by his own intol intolerance and bigotry, or perhaps by his loyalty to the president who had appointed him just a few years earlier, missed the obvious point. Racial prejudice was the issue. That was the whole point. I agree with the characterization later provided by now Chief Justice Roberts just a few years ago in 2018 when he noted that, quote, Korematsu was gravely wrong the, the day it was decided and has been overruled in the court of history, and to be clear, has no place in the law under the Constitution, close quote. No person should ever be in prison solely due to their race. Shouldn't be even a factor in anyone's imprisonment, certainly not in the United States of America. Japanese internment is one of the very worst example, one of the very worst examples of our government rejecting its founding principles. It's something that should be rem remembered so that it can never be repeated. Despite this mistreatment by government, Japanese Americans served faithfully in, in many capacities during World War II and have continued to serve our nation and their communities in irreplaceable ways. Their contributions are, are worth remembrance and celebration. Regrettably, the United States has failed to meet other, admittedly far less fundamental, obligations that it's made to individuals and to states. One of those obligations is relevant here, ironically uh, arising in the context of an effort to honor victims of FDR's internment of Japanese Americans. The federal government has neglected commitments made by Congress to Western states at the time of their admission to dispose of large swaths of federal land. Similar promises have been made to most states that were admitted into the Union ever since the Louisiana Purchase. But for the fact that Congress honored such promises with respect to a lot of these states, including states like Illinois and Missouri, the federal government would still, to this day, own around 90 percent of those states. And the same can be said of many, many others. Although Utah received such assurances from Congress, prior to its admission into the Union in 1896, using essentially identical language, Utah is still waiting for the federal government to honor its end of the bargain. However, unlike states like Illinois and Missouri, which received the benefit of the federal bargain, Utah did not. The federal government still owns more than two-thirds of all the land in my state, resulting in 
an extraordinary amount of environmental, economic, and educational consequences that hurt Utahns, particularly those Utahns in poor and rural communities. In fact, in a blatant insult to the people whose families settled and developed much of the rural West and their communities, the federal government continues to limit and restrict access, commerce, mining, drilling, and grazing on land it had promised to relinquish. Rural farms, industries, and communities are shrinking and dying because of this continually broken promise. To add insult to injury, the feds routinely fail to care properly for the land in their portfolio. The maintenance backlog in the national park system is years long and $12 billion in the hole. The Bureau of Land Management controls vast swaths of the western United States. It controls them from Washington, D.C., with little interest or regard for the people whose livelihoods and way of life depend on that land. This relationship remains a vexing problem for everyday life in Utah. Businesses are shuttered because the federal government capriciously halt, halts mineral extraction authority. Ranches go bankrupt because the Bureau of Land Management ends grazing rights in areas where families have raised cattle for generations. And then just last week, federal land managers damaged an exquisite collection of dinosaur fossils and would have continued doing so but for the intervention of a noble citizen named Jeremy Roberts who was willing to call them out on it. At a time when the federal government already owns far more land than it can manage, Congress should be really cautious about decreasing federal land holdings. It should be going out of its way to decrease its federal land holdings and doing that rather than increasing them. Recognition of sites like the Amache Camp deserve better than federal management. However, if those representing the state of Colorado think the federal government can do better, or for whatever reason just want it to be under the national parks jurisdiction rather than subject to local control, then I'm not inclined to argue with them. I, what I w would like to ask is that this land uh, not continue to be acquired by the federal government with no plan in sight for dealing with the size of the federal footprint. It's the, the, the size of the overall federal land estate that worries me because the federal government has not proven a good steward of what it's got. So if we keep adding to that, it's only going to perpetuate some of these problems. Now, I've been wrongfully portrayed by some in the media as being somehow against this historical recognition and against commemorating as a warning to future generations and to honor the victims of the past, uh, one of this nation's uh, and its government's most tragic missteps. I continue to negotiate in good faith to find a way forward with this bill. Now, I've been in communication with the lead sponsor of the House, and I, 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 I think there are ways that we can address this uh, uh, to address both, uh, both goals at issue. I, I think we need to be able to commemorate these events, and we also need to do so in a way that won't lead to the unfettered expansion of the federal land footprint. And so, Madam President, I, I ask unanimous consent that the Senate proceed to the immediate consideration of calendar number 255, H.R. 2497. I further ask that the Lee Amendment at the desk be considered and agreed to, that the committee reported amendments be agreed to, that the bill as amended be considered read a third time and passed, and that the motions to reconsider be considered made and laid upon the table. I, I don't think we're, we're far off in, in where we are on this. Um, it, is, um, it is true that um, it's not uh, an expanse of land that is as big as some other land transfers we see one square mile. On the one hand, uh, a lot of people would regard that as, as large, 640 acres, uh, the acreage equivalent of one square mile. I would note here that this isn't, uh, I wouldn't call it an, a federalism argument that we have to allow this. There are federal implications to this that extend far beyond what uh, a, a local unit of government might, might want to do. Because what happens is when you transfer it into the federal estate, we do incur additional obligations uh, to make sure that that land is maintained and managed appropriately. It does cost money, and it, it takes an expense off the books of those who would otherwise be maintaining it 
So it's, it's not without any consequence at all, and, nor is it a matter of simple uh, uh, operation of federalism to say that we should allow this in, in this circumstance. I would note, moreover, that um, we've come closer on this. The amendment that I offered a moment ago that uh, my friend and colleague, uh, the senator from, uh, from Colorado, objected to is one that would allow this to happen, uh, but would require an offset to be made by the appropriate federal land managers within one year of the transfer of this land. There's nothing about that that strikes me as particularly unobjectionable, particularly given the fact that the federal government owns and manages about 30 percent of the land mass in the United States, in, in my state and in Colorado. It's much more than that, but um, uh, there's nothing about that that should be particularly objectionable. That said, the senator from Colorado has, has changed this legislation in a meaningful way. And because I've got a desire to honor those victims of uh, this horrific event in American history, and the senator from Colorado has offered up a separate solution, uh, one that would involve donation rather than acquisition by the federal government. And although that also raises some concerns in that over time, I think we've got to watch this because the more we enhance the federal land footprint, the more difficult it will be for the federal government to keep up with the maintenance backlog. But given that this doesn't directly impact uh, uh, concerns quite the way uh, uh, the, those same concerns might be implicated if we were having to purchase it at the outset, um, I'd be inclined, if, if my friend from Colorado were interested in offering that amendment, um, uh, uh, to withhold any objection from that, while noting that it's, it's my hope and expectation that moving forward, we can be more aware of these issues, and that as we see the federal land footprint increasing, we can take steps as a body to make sure that uh, uh, there's some natural stopping point uh, even before we turn to what I, I believe we still have got to turn to, which is the commitment made at statehood uh, that still needs to be honored.